All right, everybody, welcome to the open source on-ramp mini conference where we explore IT topics at an introductory level. Uh, here to help us navigate to the choice of choosing an open source project is Gila Fish. Gila, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hey, can everybody hear me okay? Awesome. Cool. Uh, so first of all, thank you for coming, especially at that time of the day. I know it's a bit, uh, everybody is tired and want to go home. So I really appreciate that you're uh, here. And I want to talk to you uh, today about open source. And open source is open choice, right? Because everyone can use it, choose when to do it. And I'm going to share with you the DevOps perspective towards open source. And also when you should consider using open source and pra practical tips that will help you choose the right open source project for you. So first of all, hi, uh, my name is Hila Fish. I'm a senior DevOps engineer and I work for Wix. I have 15 years of experience in the tech industry. Uh, recently, I have joined the AWS Community Builders program, which is good and allows me to expand my uh, community, which is, this is what we are all about. Uh, I help co-organize uh, conferences in Israel, where I live, DevOps Days Tel Aviv and Statscraft Monitoring Conference. I'm a mentor in courses and communities. Uh, I also manage a uh, co-manage community in Israel called Pull Request for open source. Uh, we have almost uh, 5,000 uh, members, and I'm going to touch a bit about it at the end if I will have time. Uh, I'm a DevOps culture fan. I think this is what helps companies achieve great things. And I'm a lead singer in a cover band, as you can see in this picture. It is a lot of fun. OK, so open source um, is basically publicly available, right, and can be modified uh, at will. And a lot of tools that we use in our day-to-day -day is uh, open source. So um, GitHub and um, React and, and Firefox and a lot of things. And I will just break through a bit because I did uh, like a, an issue where I forgot to close my uh, Slack and all, and I hear notifications, so just uh, so me, for me to be uh, fully with you. I'm so sorry about that. Unprofessional, don't do that. Okay. Okay, now I'm fully with you. Cool. So, a lot of uh, tools that we use in our day to day is open source, and it is awesome to know because we all want to amplify the open source uh, realm whenever we can. So, in the late 90s, uh, open source was considered to be a bad strategy for companies, and they didn't re uh, really want to open source projects or help uh, boost this uh, community. And starting from and coming from, forward from 2020 onwards, we can see that open source basically became um, just a mainstream, right? And a lot of companies contribute to it, uh, outsource their, their code and stuff like that. So what's so good about open source? Let's talk, I mean, I'm sure that you all think it's good because we are in open source conference, but we will touch a bit and maybe uh, help amplify it even uh, better. So open source is a rich developer community, right? And it really is based on knowledge, but without communication and collaboration, it wouldn't be at the place it is uh, right now. And Manish Sharma, who's the general manager of GitHub India, he basically said that open source is an enabler of innovation and companies that uh, go towards uh, and turn to open source, it helps speed up their business uh, transformation, which is good because we all know that if we are able to um, influence the tech landscape, we can achieve a lot of uh, good things and help shape our future. So open source helps uh, boost code quality and security because as uh, Linus Torvalds, which was in a panel yesterday, uh, the, the creation of Linux and Git, right? Uh, he said that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, meaning that if you, uh, if a lot of people review the code, they can spot errors and omissions. And if they don't only spot them, they actually correct them, then the code will be uh, in much higher uh, quality and it will be uh, more secured. Um, also, adaptivity, right? So more use cases, as long as the project has more users, it will have more use cases, and then the code will be uh, much more robust. Uh, it it's also encourages more modularity because it avoids the one-size-fits-all uh, assumption, uh, resulting in greater flexibility and lower customization costs in the long run. Um, and also agility. So 
open source tools usually follow modern uh, software uh, development processes, which leads to rapid development cycles, which leads to more frequent uh, releases without sacri sacrificing uh, quality. And uh, we have less uh, bureaucracy, right? Because uh, proprietary software has uh, its own uh, development cycle, and as opposed to open source, we just uh, they release projects and we can use them whenever uh, we want. And there is no uh, really, um, you know, regular um, stance to it, right? They just release it and that's that. Um, okay, so let's talk about the DevOps perspective towards open source because I think that usually this is something that is more discussed from the developer uh, angle and I want to share with you how me uh, and I think a lot of DevOps uh, people see it. So in order to understand that, uh, let's uh, touch on the developer perspective. Developers say we want functionality and we want to make sure that the code uh, that I get from the uh, library, the open source library, will get integrated in my code properly and I need to see what uh, efforts are needed to do so. As opposed to that, we, develop, we DevOps uh, think about our environment and we need to think about how the project, now it's not a library, it's usually a project or a tool, how it will get inter integrated in our environment and we have peripheral um, uh, things to consider, right? Like security and maintenance and stuff like that. So we have a lot of other things to consider when we introduce an open source project to our environment. Another thing is that when it comes to challenges, collaboration leads to better conclusions and solutions. So a common ground between DevOps and open source is collaboration. And when I need help with something or I need to do some stuff, I feel, at least in my experience, I can feel I can go to open source and just, I assume good faith and I know that they will help me because we are all a community and we want to help each other. So um, it's very easy for me to go uh, to open source and uh, achieve what I need and not, as opposed to just go to a proprietary software and that's that. And since my focus is the environment, I want to make sure that I have the best solution offered for my environment. So since a lot of people come together, a lot of people means a lot of minds, and then it will surface better uh, conclusions and solutions, which is always good because I always want to aim for the best solution possible for my environment. Uh, we treat open source as tools and, and we ask ourselves, do we want to introduce this project to, uh, to the system because it will allow me to deliver this code or it will allow me to automate this or introduce this capability, right? So since a lot of DevOps engineers came from the system background, system engineering background or system administration background, then the concept of integration is no strange to us. So we can just integrate another tool to our tool belt, uh, our tool chain and Ba that's basically it. Um, so of course, not everything is, is bright and early, uh, bright and, and good in, in, the, in the world, right? And there are also uh, risks uh, involved. And since our uh, focus is our environment, we want to make sure that we don't rock the boat too much. So let's take, for example, Jenkins. Uh, it is open source. And I don't know one single person that is able to upgrade Jenkins version or Jenkins plugins without having any fear that something will break. Just last week I had an issue that someone upgraded because he said, ah, it's only a version. No, and even the rollback didn't work. So it is uh, something to consider and we want to make sure we don't uh, rock the boat too much. And we also have a lot of variety out there, right? A lot of uh, projects that we need to think about. Is this good enough? Is this cover my use case? And a lot of things to consider. With uh, certain complexities like Jenkins, also Kubernetes has its own dependencies and stuff like that. So we have these trade-offs all the time of if I want to upgrade now because it's worth it and I need this version and, and these features right now, or I should wait and not rock the boat too much because I care about the environment and the environment stability. And in the middle of everything, we have the uh, research. So each time I have a project to, to consider whether to integrate or not, I read about it, I Google it, I see videos, overviews to make sure that I really know what I introduce to the uh, environment. Uh, another thing is that we always need to keep tabs and be informed uh, of what's going on. And I will um, explain. For example, let's take CentOS. CentOS, uh, um, operating system reached end of life at the end of 2021. If I didn't know about that, then I'm putting my systems at risk because end of life means no security patches getting released. 
So I should be informed and know what's going on because if not, my systems will be uh, at risk. And another, uh, another option uh, or uh, example that I can, I can give you is that let's say I found a, an open source tool. Um, version 1.0 is not that great, but uh, if I wait and see and, and follow the, the project uh, status, I will see that, hey, version 2.0 is good because that bug, fix, that bug was fixed and uh, this feature that I waited because th this feature really fits uh, my use case now got released, so now this uh, version is good for me. So that's why um, keeping tabs and, and getting informed of what's going on is very, very important, not only in the open source realm, but also as a DevOps engineer or any engineer for that matter. And I really like this picture because it says, keep moving people without, as you can see, no one is there. Because this is the mindset. You should always uh, be proactive and think uh, of what's going on and check what's going on and keep tabs without having your team leader uh, breathing down the, your neck and saying, hey, please check in this and this. Because I think this way, you will be a better engineer, in my opinion. Okay, so when should we consider a open source? Because there are a lot of uh, scenarios. Let's cover, I think, I, I don't think these are the entirety, but these are the major ones, in my opinion. So uncommon use case. I, I can share with you a, an example uh, in which I, in one of my previous jobs, I used, we had uh, applications running on Kubernetes, on GKE. Uh, and there was a certain application that didn't need to run all the time. And we want to save some money, right? Because if it doesn't have to run all the time, why should it? And th at that time, GKE, I, don't, I think it's still uh, the case now, GKE allows only downscaling to one, the pods to one and not to zero. So we searched online and found and wanted to see if there is a solution for that. And we found a tool called Keda. Keda is an awesome tool, production ready, and uh, it allows you to downscale pods to one based on several uh, criteria like pub sub uh, consumption and some, stuff like that. So once we found this uh, option, awesome, we can use it, and it was really fitted our use case, uh, and basically that's that. So if you have an uncommon use case, you can uh, Google uh, for an open source tool that will maybe uh, cover that use case for you. Limited budget, so of course, uh, if you don't have the budget for it, you can either use a free version of a proprietary software or use an open source and, and boost open source while you're at it. And uh, the thing about it is you, you need to think about the, the lower total cost of ownership. So open source is usually free, right? You need to check the licenses. I will also touch a bit about it later on. But it's usually free and proprietary software isn't. And there is the same amount of uh, training and maintenance and integration time that, and efforts that uh, are invested, uh, whether you choose to integrate an open source tool or proprietary so software. So if you know, it's equally invested, might as well uh, choose the open source uh, option if you don't really have uh, you know, something very critical that prevents you uh, from choosing that. Uh, okay, so, you know, uh, this is pretty much the straightforward one. Uh, when you have insufficient in-house resources ability-wise, like this uh, family guy right here, or capacity-wise, to either create um, a solution from scratch or to enhance something uh, of your own, then you can just uh, go to open source tool and, and, and use one that fits your needs because there's also the, this uh, saying, why reinvent the wheel, right? So if, the, um, if there is already an open source tool that covers your needs, so just use that and that's that. Okay, so we covered of why to choose open source and good things that come out of using open source, but like everything in life, we have also disadvantages. So of course, again, these are not the only ones that are available, but these are the ones that I thought that it's really worth uh, mentioning. So first of all, uh, security by obscurity, this uh, concept is not applied, right? Because uh, closed source uh, companies can say that since they are closed source, Hackers can't view the code for, uh, you know, spot uh, security loopholes and stuff like that. So this um, uh, notion doesn't apply on open source. It's something to uh, just to think about and bear in mind when we uh, choose an open source project. Um, point to abuse. So it doesn't happen a lot, I would say, because people are usually good, especially open source uh, contributors. They want to achieve good and create good things, but sometimes stuff happen, right? And I have two uh, examples in mind. 
One of them is the colors NPM package in which the maintainer added uh, a loop in the code and a lot of, a lot of companies suffered from it. And another um, uh, example is the Faker.js uh, package in which the maintainer uh, had a bankruptcy and then the next version that he released was actually to delete the project. He removed this project in, the, in its entirety. So it doesn't happen a lot and you can say, yeah, well, I can just put maybe, if it's a library, I can put the, the, the version in packages JSON lock or requirement 60 and that's that. But if everyone would do it, I wouldn't be here talking to you about this scenario because probably not a lot of people would hear about it. And I'm from Israel, I'm all the way there. So it, it, is it could happen, so we need to just bear that in mind and, and think about it when we choose an open source project. Compliance, so in its raw form, uh, open source tools and, and libraries doesn't uh, provide uh, like a warranty or a, or um, um, how they call the, the word, official guarantee, yeah, this is what I want, or official guarantee for uh, compliance. So there are companies that need that, right? They, have, they need to be compliant, they need to do some uh, regulations and audits and stuff like that. So uh, it's also something to consider when um, going down this path. Um, it's all, not always uh, free, right? You need to uh, examine the licenses carefully before you uh, choose uh, an open source project, especially if uh, you choose it because of a budget thing. Discontinued projects. So not all projects are backed up by vendors. A lot of projects are maintained by people like you and me. So they can, you know, just decide to stop uh, maintaining the project and it's okay that this is their prerogative, right? So if that's the case and you uh, chose an open source project and integrated and it got uh, discontinued, then it means that either you need to migrate to another solution or you will be the ones to maintain this project from now on. So it's also something to consider. Support is not guaranteed, so uh, you need to assume good faith, but as I mentioned with Keda, uh, I, I do assume good faith and we had, just before it uh, became production, I had some uh, issues with it. I opened the PR, I explained the issue, I said, please guys, it, it's going to be production very, very soon. I would really appreciate your help with that. And they released the version for me, it was really not, uh, not, no business hours, okay? It was, I think, Saturday or something like that. So they were really, really helpful. Uh, so yeah, support is not guaranteed. You should really assume good faith, but like a disclaimer, proprietary software does um, um, provide a support guarantee, but it doesn't uh, guarantee the support will be good. So just something to, to think about. And SaaS alternatives, uh, it's not really the opposite of open source, but a lot of companies will um, since a lot of companies shift more and more uh, resources to the cloud, then you, we will see more and more uh, adaptations of managed services because a lot of companies prefer to have a, a, like a cloud lock scenario rather than have their DevOps uh, teams maintain uh, open source tools. So to sum things up in regards to adopting uh, open source in general, there is no right or wrong. It's a matter of perspective and there are multiple factors to consider. So you should uh, choose the best uh, open source project that fits your needs. And speaking about fits your needs, how do we choose an open source project? Because there are a lot of projects out there and maybe I Googled uh, my use case and found two or three options. So let's see how we can choose the right one that fits uh, our needs. So first of all, <laughs> these are the questions that you can basically ask yourself in order to, to get this, um, to, to, to have this understanding. So I'm gonna cover popularity, activity, readiness, documentation, ecosystem, ease of use, and roadmap. So let's cover each one. Uh, popularity, so check how uh, many GitHub stars the, the project has. Uh, it's not always the, the, the only thing that you should uh, uh, check because a lot of companies, uh, a lot of project, uh, open source projects does have a vendor uh, behind them. So maybe they have also marketing and stuff like that. So don't look only about uh, the, the GitHub stars, but coupled with other um, metrics as well. Uh, is the project part of CNCF and incubator? Because if so, it means that it, you have a stamp that this project is probably popular and follows uh, certain standards that will mean that this project is mature enough to use. Uh, 
You should Google the product alone to check for online presence, but you should also Google it versus similar products to check for reviews and see maybe someone said something about the use case or issues that they had that will uh, be relevant for you as well. Activity, so check the commit rate. Are they day daily, weekly, monthly? How many issues are there? How many releases are there? Are the, is the product maintained by one developer or more? Is the product has a uh, sponsor that believe in the product future and willing to put uh, good money to, to see the product uh, evolve? So all of these questions are meant for you to understand that if you decide to integrate this project and you will need maybe bug fixes or you will need features, how long should you wait until you get those? So um, if you have a heavy use case, you probably wouldn't go with a project that is not very uh, active because if you will have issues, you wouldn't have any support with that because it's not very active. So this is very important, um, especially for a heavy use case, uh, to know uh, how active is the project. Um, documentation, so, uh, not documentation, sorry. Readiness. So is the, because I see the next uh, slide in my computer, so it's a bit confusing. So readiness. Um, is the project declared as a production ready? Third time a charm, I'm going to mention KEDA again. So KEDA is production ready. They declare it as such. We, I saw use cases of users in production. So it is awesome for me as a DevOps engineer to know that it's production ready because I care about the environment. And if something is production ready, it means that it will be good for the production environment. Uh, are the current features enough to sustain usage? And is my use case covered fully in the current state? And if not, am I okay with it? Because if not, maybe, as I said, maybe we need to wait uh, for the next version to come out that will be more uh, suitable for my uh, needs. Documentation. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong afterwards, but Documentation is like the gateway for the project, right? You don't know anything about this project, and documentation is your way to understand uh, stuff like how to integrate and known issues and explanations about the features. So this will help you understand how mature it is and how uh, well thought of and the extent of the features and which bugs are there. So documentation is very, very important when you face a new project that you need to integrate. It will help you in the integration process. It will help you in your day-to-day -day maintenance. So if a project is not well documented, probably I wouldn't say just steal away like in its entirety, but it is something to consider because Opens, because documentation and ecosystem in which I will uh, cover in a bit is very, very important to your day-to-day. -day. Uh, ecosystem. So I think this is the most important metric out there because this is the metric that will help you in your day-to-day, -day, and I will give you an example for that. In one of my previous jobs, I used uh, Randec as the CI tool, and back at the time, uh, the documentation wasn't really good, in my opinion, and the ecosystem was uh, pretty much small. So I had to create more flows and introduce more capabilities. It was pretty hard because I didn't have documentation or the ecosystem to reach out to. As opposed to that, uh, in other company that I worked for, I used Jenkins, and you can say a lot of things about Jenkins, but the ecosystem is very, very big. Uh, they have their own uh, Slack uh, workspace, so you can uh, uh, use the community to, to help you with a lot of issues. So ecosystem is very, very important because it will help you in your day-to-day. -day. So because, think about it this way. Integration of a tool is a one-time, right? So if the integration was hard, that's okay because you don't do it a lot and you can also create the competition after that to help you with the integration process and make it better and easier next time. But the documentation and ecosystem are the ones that help you in your day-to-day -day and will help you maintain it easier uh, in the long run when you use it uh, daily. So, uh, yeah. And finally, uh, not finally, it's very confusing to have the next slide. Uh, Never mind. So ease of use, uh, do a POC, see, see how well the project got integrated in your environment, and also the ratio between the amount of time to implement until the integration is done. So you know uh, what took uh, time. Is it stuff internally on your company, or the documentation wasn't great enough to, to explain how to integrate properly, and stuff like that. And another important reason, another important thing to 
to uh, consider is check the issues. Are the issues on GitHub about features or about how do I do X? Because if the issues are about how do I do X, probably it's not that easy uh, to use that project, so you also uh, need to uh, think about that. And finally, roadmap. So is the project defined as an open source or is it planned to go towards monetization, which means it will be uh, soon uh, closed source. Some, com some uh, projects declare that, so that, uh, that way you can uh, know about it. And also features planning. So if the project is well thought of and you know that um, features are planned ahead and they know what they are going to introduce and they know what they are planning to do, then a, you can you know, check and, and see maybe how you, I will wait for the next version that has this feature. And B, you know that this, it is active and very well maintained and thought of. You can also check, again, Keda, I know I, they didn't pay me to, to say that, I, I promise you. So Keda, they have like a very uh, well thought of feature planning. They announce it, so it is very well uh, maintained. So roadmap is also good to understand uh, what's going to be happen in the future with this project. Um, so yeah, so I covered all these questions. So to sum things up in regards to how to choose an open source project, you should ask the general questions to cover the basics, uh, meaning is the project in a ready enough state to, to be used or not? And you should cover and, and ask the tailored specific questions for your use case and your pain points. So for example, uh, if you have a heavy use case, you should focus and put the emphasis on the documentation and ecosystem metric, as I explained uh, a bit before. And if you, for example, don't have capacity uh, for maintenance, then you should fo focus and put the emphasis on the readiness and ease of use uh, metrics. So choose the ones and put the weight on the ones that fit your use case and your pain points, and then uh, you will know that this project will be more uh, suitable for your needs. Uh, do, do a POC, see how well uh, it gets integrated in your environment, and rely on your research. So ecosystem for the win, and engage in GitHub, uh, raise issues, and basically that way you will contribute to the project success and eventually your success. And small token for me, uh, just before we wrap up, uh, if you want to contribute to open source uh, without writing a single line of code because you don't know how to write code or because you don't have the time to do it. So these are... Um, the ways that I uh, thought about. Uh, open issues, bug issues, or feature requests, that way this project will get enhanced and more users will be able uh, to use that. Documentation. Documentation is very, very, very important, as I in, uh, explained before, and writing documentation is a skill. So if you have the skill, leverage it, because that way the documentation of the project could be more enhanced, more thorough, and as you saw, it is a metric to choose a project, so maybe people will uh, adopt this specific project that you contributed uh, documentation for just because of you, just because of the stuff that you added. So it's very, very uh, important, and if, if you have this uh, a, a skill, please leverage it. I will thank you, everyone will thank you. Share your use case. For example, I've written a blog post about the script server, which is an open source tool that make uh, Terraform uh, code and Ansible and other scripts uh, available through UI. And it was good because I wanted to make uh, non-techie people use stuff and without ability to win stuff, and it has also a permissions mechanism. So I wrote a blog post about it, and hopefully that way people knew about this project and maybe adopted it. And I shared you know, open source to the world and saw that to, to show that we have good things going on. Um, share other tools that you found with your colleagues and techie friends, because they, if they know about it, they can use it. Sponsorship. You know, money makes the world uh, go around, and uh, money always uh, is good to help um, tools that need to be maintained, and sometimes they rely on that money to, to uh, keep maintaining this project. So if you're able to chip in individually or have your company sponsor a project, this is awesome to have. Hold an open source mindset. So think about it this way. If I have a use case, I can go to search for a proprietary software that uh, covers my use case, or I can Google uh, for an open source solution that will help me and be uh, not less good as the proprietary software option. And if I do it, I can share it with my 
environment that work, team members or other teams, and they maybe uh, will get inspired by that and will start thinking about open source themselves. So open source mindset is good because others can get inspired and uh, do it as well. And uh, last but not least, spread the word on open source on conferences like I'm doing just now. And I think I have a little bit more time to cover another thing that I'm doing in regards of uh, open source. I uh, co-manage an open source community in Facebook called Pull Request in Israel, where I live. We have almost 5,000 uh, members. And we try to do uh, you know, workshops and stuff like that to help push people to contribute more and more to open source. And one of the initiatives that we have called uh, Open Source Rel, like DevRel, but Open Source Rel. So as I've written in this repository, you will find testimonies by companies stating their vision about open source and how they actively contribute to the open source realm. So you will find a lot of things. I mean, it just started out, so you see only a few companies, um, but it covers a lot of things that they do, like um, Wix, for example. They, um, um, I work for Wix, but you know, I will cover another example so you, you won't think I'm biased. Uh, Checkmarks, they release uh, projects to uh, open source. They have like a Slack channel that helps uh, others contribute as well. So you can uh, read about it. And if you have, this is Omnam, uh, Omnam. I, I had a Hebrew word coming out, sorry. If uh, uh, this, uh, this is a, a, um, a community in Israel, but it's not only for Israeli, because as you can see, I've written in English. I have uh, also a, a, a Hebrew edition. But if you want to have your company featured in this, and I will share it with the Israeli uh, community, but not only, we'll share it also in LinkedIn, stuff like that, it will help amplify open source uh, as it's very important. You know, this uh, track is called Open Source on Ramp. We want to help amplify the uh, open source voice. and have a good PR for our company, uh, why not? And the reason why we did it, like uh, individuals, why we did uh, this initiative, is since this is an open source community, it means that a lot of people there are passionate about open source and they contribute in their spare time. So think about it this way. If I contribute to open source and I care about it deeply, and I, then I see companies that actually dedicate a, a week in a quarter, okay, not a month, in a quarter to contribute to open source uh, during the time, the work hours like Wix does, then it makes me want to go work for this company because I wanna, I wanna contribute to open source in that time and I wanna be in a company that share my values uh, about open source like them. So this is also uh, good to, to know for me because that way I can actually choose the next company that I work for because of that. So if you want to have your uh, company featured, you can reach out to me. If not, you can just read and get inspired and maybe show it to other companies and maybe they will get inspired to do more and more stuff in the open source realm. Uh, and you know, this is our way to try and boost open source uh, in Israel. So yeah, that's it. Um, I hope that I will, were able to demonstrate both the DevOps perspective, amplify the open source voice and give you practical tips, as I showed, of how to select an open source project because there are a lot of projects out there, so we need sometimes this guidance. So I hope the questions that I showed you will provide you the guidance that you need to adopt open source in your environment. Thank you so much. And I think we have time for questions, so if you have any questions, feel free. Going once. Ah, there is one out there. Um, do we have a mic or just speak up? We have a mic. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Uh, I start with a disclaimer. I'm a security uh, person. So important. <laughs> yeah. Um, quite many of the uh, Criteria that you have listed, they mm. also uh, help um, choosing software that will be also secure and not just popular. Okay. Uh, so, but my uh, question is, uh, when you are choosing uh, software for your DevOps installation, mm -hmm. uh, do you also look at pending bugs, for example, security vulnerabilities and such issues? Um. I can tell you that some time ago I haven't, 
But since the, you know, all the su supply chain issues that surfaced as, uh, as the examples that I gave of the colors and PM and stuff like that, they surfaced more and more uh, re recently, then I am also looking at that. I, I can't say it's the main thing that I, I look uh, because usually um, we use tools that not that are pretty boxed, and since I don't integrate them in code, but integrate them in environment, then we are not as, as exposed as it's when it's integrated in code. But nevertheless, I do look at, at that, and maybe I will also edit and refine my um, presentation because of, of it, because it really is important. And it's, it's not always people think about security as they should. So if I can help you know, amp uh, imply, amplify that as well, I will do it. And, Thank you for that. So for sure, it's something that needs to be uh, considered. And, and I will also check how and, and discuss it with other DevOps engineers, how they uh, perceive it in regards to our tools and our uh, tool chain that we use. So thanks for that. Anything else? Yeah. Um, regarding contribution, which is not necessarily writing code, um, how would you know that a project is uh, well, also in regard with writing code? I will repeat the questions if you didn't hear. Uh, for people that want to contribute to open source and, and open source uh, tools in the DevOps realm and not specifically code, how they do it if they are not seniors and, and juniors. So the way for DevOps to contribute to open source is usually the peripheral stuff, like not writing the code itself, but help with the GitHub actions or help with the CICD of a project or documentation or uh, if it's Kubernetes, then maybe help with the operators and stuff like that. So more in the peripheral stuff and not like hard code uh, code because not all DevOps engineers know how to write code as programmers. But uh, I really believe that a lot of, uh, you can see a lot of uh, open source tools that have like a, f a first good issue, then they should be doing it, doing it for, for every um, tool because since you want to help uh, ease people into, um, you know, contributing to that project, then everyone should have like a first good commit. And, but this is in general, but also the fact that the other DevOps contributions are usually in the peripheral that makes us feel comfortable that, okay, this is my area of expertise, the CICD, the, to make it uh, more maintained or more uh, rich, uh, you know, have greater reach. So that way, even if we are uh, juniors, since we know this is what expected of us, then juniors will know that, okay, this is a good time to, to practice it. It's best to do it in an open source and not in production. And I hope that this will help them uh, feel that they can do it just right off the bat and not be afraid of that. Anything else? Okay, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, thank you.